Welcome to the Cara Project Podcast. I am Heather Erickson, and this is Sarah West. Sarah West, and we are so excited to have you here today. Today, we are going to be learning how to study the Bible. And, you know, Sarah, you and I have been doing Bible study with people from different backgrounds and different faiths for many, many, many years. Yep. And what's great about our experiences is we've seen this like unsatiable hunger to learn how to study the Bible, which is actually what birthed the car project Mm -hmm. and got us excited about teaching people how. And so today we're going to spend a little time uncovering kind of the core of behind what we do, which Mm -hmm. is the Cara Bible Study Guide. If you haven't downloaded it off of our website, I encourage you to do so. This guide is packed full of great questions that are easy to do on your own personal Bible study, but also with uh, groups. And we've done it with both Bible study groups and per our own personal Bible study. Yes, absolutely. T- tested and approved. Um, and so we're going to walk through it today. And you know, God had a sense of humor when he gave us our name. Kara means joy in Greek, and it's spelled C-H-A-R-A. And what's hilarious is as we started uncovering how we wanted to teach people how to study the Bible, the name Kara ended up becoming the acronym in which we were going to use. So thank you, Lord, for right. having a sense of humor, as he always does. And helping us out. And 100% helping <laughs> us out. So um, our C-H-A-R-A that we're going to walk through today, and we're going to spend the majority of our time just hunkered in these different letters. Each of them come with different questions you can ask as you're studying the Bible. The C stands for context. You're understanding the text around it. H is history. You want to understand the history and culture of its time. The A is author and understanding an author's purpose. R is research. What's that? The deeper word meanings behind some of the languages we're we're reading. And then we apply. Now, I just want to make a note. When we're studying the Bible, we're not doing this, like this Kara always in order. Right. There's not this checklist that we're going to be following. We're going to do an order today just because we're kind of trying to be nice to you guys and not get you too confused. (laughs) But our hope and desire is that you maybe don't go in order all the time. And maybe you don't ask every question every time. This is just a guide. Mm Mm-hmm to bring alongside of you, tuck in your Bible. So go download it. You can print it off and fold it up and put it in your Bible. It becomes kind of this go-to resource. And so if you're a beginner and you see this list of questions and it feels overwhelming, we're going to try to call out during our time together different questions that are just the one or two questions in that section that will help you along the way. So don't be worried if this feels a little overwhelming. It's not meant to be. We want to keep this simple for you, but we also want to be able to challenge those that might be ready for their next step of asking um, other deeper questions. So we give all the questions and then we're going to help you um, go. And so let's let's dive in. Sarah, do you want to start us off with context? Absolutely. Yeah. The, as Heather mentioned, the C in, in CARA stands for context. And that's the first thing that we want to talk about and and recognize. And honestly, it's, it's an important one. It's also one of, I think, one of the easiest ones to do because all you need is your Bible. By context, we're talking about the text surrounding a verse or a passage and allowing that text to determine its meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, It's important to recognize that the Bible is actually a collection of 66 books. And all of these books were written at at different times over a span of 1,500 years and, and by many different authors. But remarkably, they all tell one unified story. And so in context, we want to recognize how, how does this passage fit within the overall story of the Bible? And, and, and I, Heather, I know all of us have at some time been, had something that we've said or something that we've done. It, we've had it. It's been taken out of context. Um, every day in my household. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> and sometimes it's funny, uh-huh. but a lot of times it's quite frustrating. It can be. Right? Very much. And I think it's often easier for us to see when someone takes the con- uh, the Bible out of context. It's, it's easier for us to see when someone else does it mm. than perhaps it is for us to see when, when we're doing it. A plank in your own eye a little right, bit. Right, <laughs> right. Um, it's always easier to find other people's faults. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but today, instead of pointing our finger somewhere else, I thought I would just take a verse that I've, quite frankly, taken out of context, a verse that I really struggled with um, and, and, quite frankly, didn't like at all. Um, it, it fell under one of my least favorite Bible verses uh, in, in that category. Um, this was, I came across this verse uh, when my kids were a little bit younger. They were in a Bible class, and they were asked to, to memorize a verse each week. Mm-hmm. This verse was brought home. It's James 2.10. And it says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Now, Heather, what what do you think of that verse? Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles is guilty of all of it? Yikes. That's like, I need to be perfect all the time. 
Absolutely Super. overwhelming, isn't it? Very much so. At the time, I was kind of into CrossFit, and I, I remember trying to do a pull-up, and I <laughs> was never quite able to do a pull-up. And I, I would try, and no matter how hard I tried and how often I you know, practiced or trained for it, I could never quite get my chin over the bar. And that's what this verse makes me think of. Mm -hmm. Like, no matter how hard I try, I, I can't ever be perfect. And you're saying that if I have one little mistake, one little sin, I'm guilty of, of, of everything. I thought it was completely unfair. I didn't like it. <laughs> um, until uh, I, I looked at or understood the concept importance of context. So that's mm -hmm. what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the context surrounding James 2.10, just to give you an idea of some of the steps that you should take when you do this. Um, the idea is if you're starting, um, especially if you're starting with just one verse, begin to work your way out. Always look at the context. First, we're going to look at the immediate context, and we're going to look for the, the um, overall theme, um, the, the main idea that's being communicated in this passage. And then um, often, immediate context will be enough. To be, to be honest, it, to, to understand the meaning of that passage. Mm -hmm. There will be times, however, you're going to want to look at it, this context within the book. How does this fit within the author's overall you know, purpose of the book? Mm -hmm. And also, how does it fit within the story of the Bible? Some books are unique. James is kind of one of those. Yeah. How does James, how does this fit within what else the Bible says? Mm -hmm. And how does it all fit harmoniously? So let's take a look at James, James chapter 2. And if we were to go back and read some verses before, in the beginning of, of James chapter 2, there's this idea um, about James is introducing this idea of these, these people were showing favoritism towards the rich, people who'd come in to, to worship in the synagogue. If they were rich, if they were dressed nicely, they would say, hey, um, take, this, take this seat here, this mm. favored seat. But if the poor people came in, then they would say, oh, go stand over there or, or sit at my footstool. Ouch. Right, and so and so you see, leading up to this passage, that James is calling out, "Hey, this is showing favoritism towards the rich, and acting as a judge." And and by the way, God doesn't show favoritism, and you know neither should you. Mm -hmm. So you start to see that leading up to um, James two ten, and. One of the things we have in our study guide here is, is you're kind of looking for this main idea. There's a couple of things you could be looking for. One is connective words um, like therefore, but, and, however. Mm -hmm. Those kind of are tying together this train of thought, and you can follow that along. Well, because the Bible wasn't written in verses. There was no yes. verses added in, except for like 500 years ago. So the idea that mm -hmm. we are throwing out um, you know, and just looking at a verse is a little bit out of the way the original authors weren't intending it to be read. They were expecting it to be read in collection with everything else around it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And here, I'm glad you brought that up. And here's one of the, we see a connective word in verses eight and nine. Um, it says, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. So this connective word here shows, but shows contrast. Mm -hmm. And James is contrasting loving your neighbor as yourself. Um, and, and, um, with, uh, and that's obeying the law, right? Yeah. Like that'd be obeying the law, but showing favoritism towards the rich and, and by neglecting the poor, that's disobeying the law. So you, you can kind of see how connective mm -hmm. words are, are used to uh, show a train of thought as well as other related texts. I'm not going to go into these right now, but questions and answers mm -hmm. when you see the a compare and a contrast or a cause and effect. And in fact, James does ask some really good, almost rhetorical questions here mm -hmm. leading up to this passage. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? He, the, the rich were treating the early Christians quite poorly. And here the Christians were showing them favoritism. Maybe, it, you know, they thought they can get something out of them. Uh, as, who knows the reason why? Um, so anyways, just be looking for some of those things mm -hmm. as you're looking for the train of thought. Um, so, so leading up to our verse here, again, James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. When I read the context around that verse, I begin to see that it's more about the heart uh, behind it. Mm -hmm. And um, it also appears that these believers, that they had probably justified their, their actions, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, justified their sin. It didn't see this behavior as sin, um, which we often, we often do. Mm -hmm. And so James, quite frankly, is calling them on it. Your actions matter. Um, and so be careful, I think, part of, what, part of the takeaway here is be careful about justifying sin or ranking sin. All sin, regardless of how little or big, um, 
makes it, it, it makes you a sinner. Mm-hmm. And that's something, quite frankly, I needed to learn. I was really good at justifying my my sin or comparing it to others, and therefore I thought my sin was little sin. Um, but sin, like pride, yeah. sin of the heart, like pride, that that's sin as well. Well, and you just got that by just reading the immediate context. You right. haven't even gotten into looking at the entire book of James or uh, or other places in the Bible where it would echo that thought. Right, absolutely. And, and so if if we were to, to expand out a little bit at this point, we were to look at the context um, of, of the book. Mm-hmm. You know, what what is the overall message of James? Um, and, and is he repeating this, you know, this this idea? And yeah, James is repeatedly, repeatedly calling believers to action and obedience to the law, especially moral law mm-hmm. and, and social justice. Mm-hmm. That, that's a big part of what, what James is doing. And you see it throughout, um, be doers of the word and not just hearers only deceiving yourselves, right? Uh, Faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. Faith without works is useless. So we we see James calling these believers Mm -hmm. to to maturity in their faith. And um, that's a a big takeaway. And so our our verse does fit within that. Um, Hey, you need to understand that what you're doing is sin. And I'm calling you to maturity here. Um, and if, so if we were to expand real quickly out to the Bible, does in the question here being really, does my interpretation, my understanding of this verse, does it hold true throughout the rest of the biblical text? And, um, there's kind of several threads when you expand out to biblical context, there's several threads you can kind of pull depending on where your mind's at, right? Or what, what the question is that's eating at you. Uh, for instance, here we could, we could ask, are there other passages in the Bible and in, in here, maybe even in the New Testament specifically that talk about showing favoritism? And there are, in fact, there's four passages and the other three passages are talking about the fact that God doesn't show favoritism. So how convicting, right? If God doesn't show favoritism, probably shouldn't be doing right? it. Because he's created all humanity in <laughs> his image and equally, yeah, we probably shouldn't be doing it either. Exactly. Um, but let's say you wanted to wrap your head more around this concept of sin, right? Like, I don't really feel like I'm a sinner, Lord, but this verse is telling me I am. Have all people really sinned? You know, mm-hmm. that's another thread you can go down. And um, and Heather, how about you tell us, if I wanted to go down that thread, if I wanted to look up this concept of sin, how would I do that? Well, I mean, number one, you haven't referen- referenced it yet, but co- cross-references mm-hmm. around would help with James and also even just biblical context mm-hmm. of looking at those cross-references in a study Bible are huge in figuring out where else in the Bible has this been talked about. But I also might look up in the concordance in the back of a study Bible, I might look up the word favoritism or look yeah. up a key word and say, where else in the Bible am I not seeing it in my cross-references that might help me triangulate where, where you're headed or where, where this could be talked about? Absolutely. And one of those cross, cross references on the concept of sin might point you to Romans 3.23, mm. for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In context surrounding that one, where James doesn't really give us the, the good news here, it, because that's not his purpose. His purpose isn't to talk about how one is saved, but, but Romans does. Mm-hmm. And the context surrounding Romans 3.23, when all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, it points to the solution. It points to Jesus being the atoning sacrifice for us and, and that we're justified freely by his grace through faith and, and we're made righteous through Jesus's righteousness. So um, it, that, that leads in here to uh, our key principle. And the key principle here is that the Bible cannot contradict itself. It, it, it being God's word, it, it, that's against God's nature mm-hmm. to lie, to change his mind, to contradict himself. So you want to look at each passage, each book, and I said James was a unique one. Because of its focus on, on works, it can be unique, and it can make us, a lot of people kind of question, gosh, does, does James contradict Paul? Mm-hmm. Where Paul is saying you're saved by faith, not through works, yeah. in Ephesians and in several places. Does this contradict? Well, we know that it doesn't um, contradict, but um, going into the context can tell how, how we can understand that, and often knowing the author's purpose. Again, James' purpose is not to talk about how you're saved, mm-hmm. um, but rather to call these early Christians to maturity in faith. Yeah. But Heather, we let's transition over to the next car principle now. But hold on. Okay. Before, before we leave this, yes. if you were a beginner and you were studying context for the first time, is there like one place where you're like, just focus there first? Don't get all over the place. Like, where would you have them? That's a, I'm glad you brought that up. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just look at the immediate context. I, I mean, truly, just look at, the, look at the paragraph. Sometimes, again, beyond the paragraph, look for the main idea. What's the theme? 
And does my understanding fit into that? Man, a lot of great Bible study just from that. If I had 15 minutes and that's what I was going to sit down and study mm -hmm. a verse, I feel like that's one of those great places yeah. I would start. So um, that's a great recommendation. All right, on to H in CARA, C-H-A-R-A. Mm -hmm. H is history. So we're looking at history as the culture because as we may not realize, that it was written over 1,500, this Bible was written over 1,500 years, mm -hmm. and it was in an Eastern culture. So for those of us that live in the Western culture today, we have a very disconnected view of of not only the ancient world, but we're also dealing with different cultures and biases and ways that we look at the world. And right. I know you're going to get into that a little bit later, Sarah, but um, when we look at history, it brings to life so much of the passage and what was the original audience trying to hear. So there's six questions we ask. They're probably the easiest to memorize in the entire Kara booklet. It's who, what, when, where, why, and how. And so we're going to walk through those today and say, okay, if we were to ask that question, let's use Paul. You were just talking about Paul. Let's use Paul as an mm -hmm. example. The Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament, and he was writing letters to different churches. So the first question we ask is, well, who who is he writing to? Um, and the nice thing is that Paul was always, he seemed to be writing letters to somebody. Um, and, you know, spoiler alert, most of the names of the letters were who they were written to. So if we're talking about First Timothy, Sarah, guess who it was written to? Well, it's either written by Timothy, but obviously you said it's written by Paul. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say it's, it's written to Timothy. That's right. Because <laughs> when we see a lot of these letters, Romans, um, you know, mm -hmm. Ephesians, Philippians, they're written to those specific people. So yes, 1 Timothy was written to Timothy. But the, the two questions we ask in who is, who is it written to? Who is it written about? And what's great about the book of Timothy within the first of the first chapter, we see that he's not only writing to Timothy, who he absolutely adores and has like the most beautiful relationship with this apprentice student mm -hmm. of his, and he just is um, gloating over over Timothy. But you also see in the first chapter that he's um, telling him to go and spread this off to the church in, in Ephesus. And so we see that it's written about and almost to the church of Ephesus to, through, through Timothy, that Timothy's going to share it. So then if we understand a little bit about the church of Ephesus, um, I'm just going to say, I got a lot of this information in my study Bible. Like okay. I went and I looked at an intro book of the study Bible and said, okay, what first Timothy, I even kind of looked at Ephesians occasionally. Cause I was like, well, he also wrote to, you know, Ephesus with Ephesians. But if I understood that church, even in the first chapter of first Timothy, it actually says that it describes them as wanting to be teachers and leaders themselves and that they were missing the mark. So even in the text, without even using my intro to study Bible, I understand a little bit about these people. And that's why most of 1 Timothy, Paul is actually addressing them and talking about the maturity of their faith, their service within the church. He's trying to help them be set up for success. And the only way you can do that is by understanding who these people are. So our tool is the text itself. That is actually really key when understanding history. And then also looking at our study Bibles, that intro to the book, it was huge. So that was number one, who? The next one, where? Where is this narrative taking place? Where is it written? That's actually two different questions. Where was it written? I mean, Paul's a great example. Most often he was writing either on his missionary journeys or he was like yeah. in jail. Right. So when you read something like in Philippians 4.13, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, it takes a little bit of a different bend in your mind to say, oh, he's not sitting on a royal throne somewhere with lots of money and he has all the success. And so of course he's feeling strength from the Lord. Mm -hmm. No, his circumstances were horrible. And yet he was feeling the strength from the Lord. That mm -hmm. changes my perspective when I understand where. It sure does. Where it was written. Yeah. But the other question we like to ask is where was it actually taking place? And if we understand, let's go back to Ephesus with, with First Timothy. If we understand the city of Ephes Ephesus, I, I'm going to stumble with this one today, you guys. <laughs> It was one of the most important cities in Asia Minor, um, in the Western Asia Minor, which is um, Turkey today. For those of you that aren't, you know, uh, really sharp on your on your ancient history, I had to look it up. Uh, I found it in my study Bible, just a hint. Um, but it was located in this direct path of sea and land trade routes. And so it became almost like the commercial epa, uh, center of okay. its day. And so when we know that about the city, the where, now it explains why the church was growing so drastically and why Paul was giving direction on leadership, because this was a church that was busting at the seams and needed leaders to be able to go and run the church. And they, they, they needed the help. And then we also realize if it's this trade route area, it's really transient. There's people from all kinds of backgrounds. So that explains why there was Jews and Gentiles that Paul was addressing in his letter. So understanding the where of the narrative brings to life maybe why he was talking to them the way he was talking to them in this specific letter. Number three. Okay, so we've done who, we've done where. Number three is when. 
When did the events take place? What was going on at history of that time? Now, Paul, um, understanding chronologically where he was at what point with writing letters, we actually have a resource on our website that is the books chronologically. I don't know if you knew this, but the Bible is not written chronologically. I, ish. Genesis to Revelation's chronological, it, you know, the, the beginning and the, the end. Ends, yeah. yeah. But in the middle of it all, you know, Paul's hopping all over the place and he's in different, pl- he's writing letters at the same time to different people. And so knowing where he was at while he was writing those letters helps you kind of place what time period these letters would have been written in. You can also find that information in the beginning of a study Bible. Mm-hmm. But in this time, what was going on in history at the time, if we go back to this Ephesus example, that that city was a very pagan city and it had this temple that was dedicated to the roman goddess of artemis now that may may, may it make more sense to us when we read in first timothy 2 where it says i urge you to live peacefully and quiet lives in godliness and holiness because they were surrounded by pagans right and so if they're surrounded by all these pagans and then yet they're like being urged to live a godly life now you understand why because they were surrounded by ew. yeah it sounds like a very diverse culture Right? Yes. Which is great because he's giving some... I mean, then if you go to the book of Ephesians and you read what he's writing in Ephesians, that book's now also going to make a lot of sense because we've already done the study of understanding the history from Timothy's perspective. Mm. Um, My favorite question, my favorite question of all to ask is um, what worldview... This is my number four question in history. What? What worldview, culture, religious, or political factors or experiences were happening in that day that would have influenced them? I, this happens to us all the time. I mean, we have so many worldviews that call, let, that taint our culture. For sure. Um, and so when we read 1 Timothy 2, 9, it actually says, I want women to dress modestly with decency and proprietary, adorning themselves with not elaborate hairstyles, gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good deeds. Sarah, when you read a verse like this, what comes to mind? Well, I get, I'm a little confused, mm-hmm. really. I mean, it, does this mean that I shouldn't uh, wear jewelry mm-hmm. and I, I should not do my hair elaborately? And, and, and I'm a little bit of confused. How do I apply this? That's right. That's exactly mm-hmm. it because we don't understand the history of that time. But that temple goddess that we mentioned in Ephesus, this one that was called Artemis, when we understand what would their cultural worldview would have been around this, this cult, it was a religious cult that women led where it taught that women were created first. So when you read this First Timothy passage, think of that in mind, that they, are, they were putting women first and that the temple priestesses dressed like they wanted to flaunt wealth. Hmm. So if the women that are in the pagan temples that are wearing elaborate hairstyles and wearing amazing jewelry, now does this change our interpretation of that passage? Because we're like, wait a second, it may not be that I'm not allowed to wear jewelry. It might be something about the specific culture of that time. Right. Um, so... Why would this message be given? Our number five question is our why. Why would this message be given to these people? And why is it included in the Bible? Just like any pastor that gives a sermon at a specific time, in a specific era, like whether they're speaking to COVID or the recession, there's a message they're giving for a reason. This is what's happening with our our friend Paul. In 1 Timothy, he's dressed, we would think today, that it's talking about maybe dressing modestly. That's what our pastors would talk about mm-hmm. today is, mm-hmm. you know, don't be dressed modest in a, from a sexual perspective. But we're now listening at the history and saying, well, I don't think this was about that. I think it was more about financial modesty hmm. and financial wealth. And should we be flaunting that side? And now this message takes on a whole new meaning where I don't want to look like a pagan around around me, Right. Um, and so it, it kind of, I don't know, Sarah, I've, I've actually was looking at these questions. I'm like, man, my, how the, this next question, this last question almost dovetails so nicely with the why we asked why the question, why the message was given. The next question is, and our last question is how, how would the original audience have heard it? And it's a little bit of the why the message was given because the original audience would have heard this passage and they would have wanted to say, I need to be set apart from the pagans. And if you put that into context, you talked about context a little bit already, but how does this fit into the big story of the Bible? Well, don't we see a theme of God mm-hmm. wanting to set his people apart from everybody else and be um, be different? And so this very much dovetails nicely into what we know about God's character of what he expects of us. So who, what, when, where, why? We got our history down. Most of the tools that I used were the text itself, a study Bible. Occasionally, I'm going to pull out a commentary. Um, and, and I, you know, we have a ton of commentaries on our website that we recommend. Uh, but 
our, okay. our key principle is before you understand it today, you need to understand it back then. We use really nerdy words like eisegesis and exegesis. Exegesis is what we want to do. We want to pull out. Exegesis means exit. We want to exit mm -hmm. out the original audience um, interpretation or what they would have heard. We don't want to do eisegesis, which is reading the text of what we would have thought this yeah. text was going to be. So, I mean, you said it earlier, Sarah, this idea that we, this passage would have meant something different to you was completely what we would have thought eisegesis and we would have just said, oh yeah, it's about, I'm, I'm supposed to take my earrings out right now. <laughs> right. But now we're, say, if we say we need to look at it from the original audience perspective, that's going to change how we interpret this. And this is a cultural, this is a cultural thing for those people at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I'm a beginner, yeah. if you're a beginner and you're asking yourself, well, how there, these are, that's a lot of questions to ask, like who, what, when, right. where, why, wow. And that's a lot of history. And I need a lot of books to be able to figure it out. Like, what do I do? If you're mm -hmm. a beginner, ask who was it written to and figure out what was going on in the world, their culture at that time. And a study Bible is just as, and the text is going to get you there. It really mm -hmm. will. It will really help you out. Is there anything I missed on the history side? Sarah? No, I think that's great. I, I, I love the, the takeaway of try to hear the passage the way the original audience would have heard it. Mm -hmm. How did they hear it? Understanding that first before we, we go to apply it. Um, but also, as you said, uh, there often you'll, you'll find that just one of these will really unlock a given passage. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the two that you called out. And, but sometimes it is just one or, or another or a couple of them. But again, it's not a checklist. So, I love that. Yeah. Great That's call. Great. All right. So our A is? Author. Yes. We're going to talk about um, the author now. Um, and we want to remember that the, the Bible was actually written by 40, about 40 different authors. They come from all different walks of life. Um, we've got, gosh, what do we have, Heather? We've got fishermen, mm -hmm. shepherds, tax kings, yeah. tax collectors, right? Uh, yeah, we, the, quite the the variety of, of authors, which don't you love that, by the way? Thank goodness. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, God's word is written, uh, you know, for, for us, and um, we're all quite unique and different. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to relate to some of these authors um, quite well. But um, so... We want to recognize uh, with author that the, uh, the, it was written and edited um, by these authors, yet it was inspired by God. And, um, and so, but it does, these different uh, books do retain some of the humanity of, of the authors, mm -hmm. right? And some of their style. And so there's quite a, there's, again, there's six things we're going to look at when we look at author. And I want to start, actually, I'm going to go out of order here, if you're following along in the CARA guidebook, but I want to start with style, because that's one of the things I think is, is important for us to just acknowledge. There's several different literary styles or genres throughout the Bible. There's about nine of them. We do have um, a reference in the back of the CARA guide that, that lists the nine of them. Uh, we've got history, poetry, narrative. You talked about letters already. Mm -hmm. We'll be in the Gospels all these different uh, literary styles and kind of just similar to the way we would approach um, satire, mm -hmm. a cookbook, the news, a blog, we would read those and approach and expect different things from each one. We would know to interpret them differently. The same was true of the original audience. These literary styles were quite common in, in that day. So um, they knew how to interpret them. There's some, the reason it's important for us is there's kind of some questions that we might read, uh, interpret, you know, poetry differently than we would a letter. Yeah. So that's, we just want to do a quick call out here to recognizing that um, there are different literary genres. Just be aware of that. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them today, but I do want to focus on perhaps just one of them, and that would be poetry. The Old Testament has a lot of poetry. I think it's the second co most common literary genre next to historical narrative. Um, so there's a lot of it. It was highly valued as a form of expression and learning in, in, these, in these cultures at that time. Poetry is unique because it reaches our minds through our hearts. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, it can kind of give us a completely different perspective. Um, a lot of the, the largest collection of poetry is actually found in the Psalms. Um, and that might be some of your most favorite, most well-loved section of the whole Bible. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the Psalms here, just to kind of get an understanding of them. There's a collection of 150 of them, and, and they were helpful. They, with the rhythm and the structure, they helped people remember God's word at a time when they didn't often have their 
own copy of the Bible, nor could they possibly even read. So Psalms were really helpful. Just mm-hmm. most people do remember words to songs um, quite easily. I'm not very good at it, but most people do. I was going to say that's more, that's more my uh, area of expertise <laughs> yes. as the musician of the two of us. And the other thing that I love out of Psalms is um, they're unique in that most of the Bible, the rest of the Bible, is, is God's word to us. Psalms are unique because it's actually man's words to God. It's man's, these, these psalmists are pouring out their hearts to God. And so it makes it um, super unique. And you can see their raw emotion mm-hmm. come out. And it allows us to um, express, show and how do we express ourselves to God um, in a real and authentic way. And so that was literary style, uh, the first one. And again, we just kind of dove into one just to get an idea of why that might be important um, and and how we interpret a a passage. We should always read a whole psalm. Mm -hmm. Never read just one verse. Again, context, Context. right? Read the whole psalm. Ask what is the overall intent of the psalmist. Um, And and it should be more read as poetry than theology. And and it's intended to to pause and reflect on God's faithfulness, on his goodness. Um, And and so it's, it's, it's unique. It's very unique. So that is style. Um, the second thing we want to look at under author is the person and who who's writing it. How do we, what, what went on in their life? What experiences did they have that influenced their writing? You already talked a little bit about Paul mm-hmm. and right. He, he was writing from jail. Um, we could go in, well, he's a fun case study, but I, I want to talk a little bit about David because David wrote a lot of these Psalms. In fact, he wrote almost half of them. Um, 73, I believe. And David, and Moses wrote one, Solomon, Solomon wrote two, and, and then several, several other authors, and a lot of them that we don't know exactly who wrote them. But let's look at David's life. What do we know about David that might influence some of the Psalms that he wrote? Um, he started out as a shepherd, right? And we know that um, he began to become a soldier, and he was a musician in Saul's court. And a lot of these Psalms are songs. They were sung together. And um, so that makes sense, that, that David would have been perfect to write these. And David was also a king. He went from the field to the palace, the shepherd and to you, king. And you found out most of this stuff just by reading, what, First Samuel? And like mm-hmm. you're finding that, like just like Paul, I found out a lot about him from Acts. It's this idea that you can usually figure out a lot about the author just by reading the text, right? Yes. I mean, you can look at the beginning of a study, uh, study Bible uh, mm-hmm. in the intro section. However, we're talking about Psalms, but I, as you just mentioned, we learned a lot about David by going to a different book, Mm -hmm. the historical books that talk about David's life and from the text itself. So yeah, first and second Samuel, we we learn a lot of that in his story. And I just pulled those out there. Um, So, so Heather, let's, um, now that we know a little bit about David, just, Mm -hmm. just the tiniest little bit here. um, Let's look at one of his Psalms. You may know this is a a, a very loved Psalm, Psalm 23. I'm going to read the first four verses. And um, then I want to ask you, how, how did some of David's experiences, how do you think they influenced what he wrote here, okay? okay? All right, so Psalms 23, 1 through 4 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. First of all, that's just a beautiful psalm. Right. <laughs> I love right. his, I love how, like, one thing I love about David's psalms is you feel the nature coming out of him because you, he hung out at, like, if he was a shepherd, not only are you hearing mm-hmm. him compare the Lord to something he's so familiar with as being a shepherd himself, um, but you hear the nature side of him coming out with these pastures and, and just the darkest valleys, the things that he has experienced are coming out on the page. Right. Just in what, what, he was a four verses you just read? Yeah. Right. And don't you love that? I, I, I imagine David, you know, at night watching over the sheep in a field and he's not listening to music. He's not listening to a podcast. He's not, he's got his face in a screen. You know, he's, he's talking to God. Yeah. And, and, and it just makes me think, well, how, how incredible is that? Mm-hmm. If we spent more time just talking to God, maybe just, you know, cause we're out there with in nature, wherever you, you can do that. Um, and, and, and coupled with him being a musician, you just start to see some of, of his, his life, his experiences, and how he views God come out in this, right? Yeah. So clearly. I love it. Um, the third thing we're going to look at here is let's talk a little bit about speech. 
And when we're talking about speech, just recognizing that the Bible often uses figurative language mm -hmm. and figures of speech. I mean, they're just like us. My kids are throwing, I have teenagers, three teenage boys. They're throwing out figures of speech all the time. I'm constantly learning. Um, but, but people do that. And, and we see that in the biblical text. So um, to be looking for things like symbolism and metaphors, hyperbole, idioms, just to be aware that, you know what, they were people too, and they used them also. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, in Psalm 23, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. In fact, Israel often referred to the Lord as their shepherd, also a rock, a shield, a fortress. fortress. Mm -hmm. um, so in a metaphor, this is a metaphor, it's not meant to be taken literally, literally but it's meant to evoke something. Um, the Lord is my shepherd. What, what does that communicate to you, Heather, Protector, about God? Like I, that, right? that, he, that he's guarding us and he's guiding us and oh, it's so good. Absolutely. Love it. Yes. And so let's move on to, um, to purpose. And this, this question actually kind of helps us see, see the author's purpose. And we're going to move here. Uh, this is a big one. What, what was the overall purpose that the author was? Why was he writing this passage? What did he want to communicate? Um, in, in Psalm 23, we see, we see you know, God, God is my guide. I can trust him. Um, I don't need to be afraid. Mm. You know, uh, he will protect me. That's, that's kind of, I think, the, the purpose that I see in that passage. Um, but David wrote other ones, too, that reflect where he was at in life. Psalm 51, if you know the story of David and Bathsheba, um, it's a psalm of repentance following David's um, affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. It's a psalm of repentance. Mm. And so there's a lot of different um, types of psalms and, and different purposes you see here. But in other books of the Bible, um, to find the purpose, um, again, the best way truly is to read the whole book. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's the best way to find a, a psalm. Uh, the author's purpose is to read the whole book. However, you can also get a help often from the intro to a study Bible. Mm -hmm. um, can, can like give the you... intro to the book? Yeah. Intro to the book. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, the intro to the book often will um, state that as well. So that can, can be helpful. Um, so there's lots of different types of psalms, psalms of lament, where you, you see people crying out to God and expressing their frustrations and um, struggles and even anger, which is helpful for us to know that we can do the same. Um, there's songs of praise, songs of thanks, psalms of thanksgiving and, 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 it, and, and others. Um, but each one of these can, can help us serve as a, a guide for us to intimate worship and prayer. Um, it allows us to praise God. It allows us to trust God like mm -hmm. David here in this one. Um, and again, to know that we can cry out to God in our struggles and be real, yeah. be real. So um, the Psalms can have a whole bunch of purposes and each one is unique, all 150 of them. Mm -hmm. And all right, let's move on to the next one here. Let's talk about looking for patterns. What is, and when talking about patterns, um, I think the easiest one to look for is repetition. And this is actually a great way to look for the author's purpose, too, is things that he repeated frequently are going to be kind of close to what he wants you to take home, you know, kind of close to his purpose. Um, other patterns um, such as parallelism, alliteration, chiasm, we won't go into all of those today because we're kind of talking about Psalms here. I want to talk about one called parallelism. Very, very common in Hebrew poetry. And it's the idea when there's two lines or, or more, and the second line is kind of repeating the same concept as the first line. It's not saying something completely different. One of the examples I like is uh, Psalms 33, 8. It says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. That's the NIV. Or it says, or stand in awe of him. And that's the CSB. A couple different translations there. But Heather... Um, knowing that these two lines, talking about fearing the Lord and revering him or and standing in awe of him, how does that help you understand what f fearing the Lord looks like? Yeah, well, because you're when you read that first line, you're like, I'm supposed to fear, I'm supposed to be scared of him, I'm supposed to be afraid of him. Right. But when you re realize that parallelism is using that second line to help repeat an idea, fearing the Lord is revering him or standing in awe of him. Wow, that changes the way I'm interpreting this verse in a very positive way. It does. Less, the, the scary way. We don't like that as much. Yeah, <laughs> it's super helpful. Very, very helpful. Great. Okay, so the last thing that we want to look at is the structure. Now, to be honest, this is a little bit more advanced. If you're just starting out, this is not something I, I was looking for when I just started out. But we want you to be aware that a lot, most the books of the Bible are not all chronologically. We're talking about how they're laid out. Um, and they're not, they're not all chronological. 
quite frankly. Um, some of them are going to be maybe more historical, focused around different events, like the first couple chapters in Genesis. They, they focus on creation, fall, the flood, the Tower of, of, of Babel. And, and so those are focused around events. And, and then there's also some that are focused around um, people. They're, they're biographical mm -hmm. in, in nature and um, or geographical, pla different places. In Exodus, it was where on route to the promised land, where were they landing? Uh, chronological, there are some that are. Luke and Acts in the New Testament are great examples of, of kind of historical narrative that is pretty chronological. Also ideological. Um, these are centered around ideas. Mm -hmm. And Paul is a great example of someone who centers his, structures his passage around um, around ideas. Um, why is this important? It, it's, it's kind of like, I like liken this to writing a Christmas letter. If you get Christmas letters, you know, and, and, and at Christmas, um, they often take on different kind of a, different flares, right? Like it can either focus on maybe their vacations, the places they went that year. It can focus on their kids. Um, it could focus on the, the message of Christmas and the hope we have in Christ and numbers. I seriously rewrote my Christmas letter like four times this year because I was trying to figure out which one I wanted to use, numbers or dates or times or places. Yeah. Right. And in each one of those kind of communicates what was important to us, what stood out to us in that year. The authors do the same thing um, mm -hmm. in, in a little bit of a different way. So the the key principle here as we walk away f with, with author is don't shout where the author whispers or whisper where the author shouts. This goes again back to, to context. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're reading... Um, if I give the example of Psalms and you look at just one Psalm, you, you don't want to take that um, and, and not pay attention to what the rest of it says. But in, in, in the idea of taking a book, for example, um, like one of the letters is a great example. If an author just barely mentions something um, and it's not really a theme that you see throughout his book, we don't need to make a big deal about that. If you want to know about, again, we talked about James. If you want to learn about salvation, go to someplace where it's shouted. Mm -hmm. Go over to some of Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we're talking, talking about there. And so beginner, yeah. you've yeah. talked about what we shouldn't do. What should a beginner do if you're studying author? Where, like, what are the questions that are like the yeah. go-to questions? Good question. Um, getting to know the person, I think who the author was, mm -hmm. what are some of these experiences that can really, really help? I think that would be a good one. Um, looking at trying to gain a sense of the purpose of the book. That way we're not taking it out of context once again. And, um, and then I, one that I just start just shouts out to me on the page when I'm reading is repetition. So I, if I would look for any patterns, it would be look for repetition because he's trying to tell you something yeah. and he's using repetition to get there. And the nice thing is you can figure that out within the text itself. Yes, absolutely. Easily. Yep. I like that. Um, yeah. okay. So we are C H A R R we're at R <laughs> and R is research. <laughs> um, research is all about digging into the original words and what it meant because the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in Greek and Hebrew and some Aramaic. And so because we have a translation, every author has to go, or every um, translator had to go in and translate the Bible out of those languages. And so what we're reading is a translation. So we have to understand the deeper word meaning. Um, we're going to ask some questions. There's, I think, five questions that we ask when we, when we go through this. But let me just stop for one second and talk about the tools that we use for this. Because this is where I think this is where most of our tools come in the most handy. Number one is our study Bibles. Um, we mentioned study Bibles a lot. We're kind of in love with them. Um, we have a lot of them personally. <laughs> Uh, because there's a lot of notes at the bottom that are by biblical scholars that have done some of the word research themselves to show you what the Greek word was or the Hebrew word was. That in itself is super helpful. There's a couple Bibles that even have little boxes with call outs of what the Greek words mean. That kind of stuff is super helpful because then you don't have to be like a super duper scholar to be able to go and look up the word yourself. So that's number one. Number mm -hmm. two is you can be super duper scholar and go and look at a Greek or Hebrew study tool. We use like biblehub.com, blueletterbible.org, Logos Bible yeah. software. There's a lot of different resources out there. We list a bunch on our website. And when you go to those, they're looking at a Strong's Concordance and saying, what was the Greek word that is most correlated to this most English word? Because when we're looking at words, there's usually like three English words for every Greek one word. And so it's trying to help you triangulate around what the word is, which brings me to my third tool, which is just read different Bible translations. Yeah. More often than not, different Bible translations are going to use different words to get across the same concept. All of it is the same scripture. It's all the same verses. They're just using different words to be able to get to that same spot. And let me just pause. 
for two seconds and describe Bible Translate. For anybody that's new to Bible translations. Yes, thank you. Right? Like, I feel like we need to just go there for a second. Why are there so many Bible translations? What is this thing all about? Now, we've already mentioned it's in a different language. If I'm a translator and I'm approaching text from a Greek or Hebrew perspective, I have a lot of different ways I can translate it. I can either go literal, like word for word, what does the actual text say? Um, text, um, Bibles that do this are like the King James Version or the um, English Standard Version. They are um, the New American Standard Bible. All of those are very word for word and very mm -hmm. literal in the way that they approach the text. You can go on the opposite side of the spectrum and go, I'm going to just try to get the, the you know, translator will say, I'm going to get the thought. What are, they, what are the ideas that they're trying to communicate rather than going word for word? And so New Living Translation, which is actually kind of a fun Bible mm -hmm. because it's trying, it's, it's wording it in a way that is such a fresh perspective. Um, but reading it through that lens gives you that thought for thought. There's mm -hmm. even paraphrased versions, but like that's pretty nice. But in the middle, between these literal and thought for thought ideas, you have more readable, dynamic styles, um, new international version, uh, Christian standard Bible, those fit, they fit in the middle. They're trying to grab at the literal and the thought for thought. They're trying to combine the both to make it easily readable, but yet also still true to the text. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, absolutely. So Sarah, we've mentioned a lot of different Bibles. Which, what's your favorite Bible translation? Yes. Um, and, and let me just mention too, if you want to learn more about what Heather was just talking about, Bible translations, mm, yeah. go to our website. We have, we have an article that might help help mm. you with that. My favorite Bible translation, that's a great question. And it kind of depends on um, what I'm trying to do, actually. Am I trying to study or am I trying to read the Bible for devotion? Mm. Uh, but my go-to, my daily Bible is the Christian Standard Bible or the CSB. I grew up on the NIV. I like that one as well, the New Internet National Version. Um, but the CSB is is really kind of in the, the middle of that spectrum that Heather was just describing. It's very readable and yet... Um, it, it conveys very well the, the original language, but in an understandable way. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite tools to compare Bible translations for free, if you don't want to, if you don't actually mm -hmm. own these five, six different Bibles, um, is, by the way, there's a lot more than five or six translations <laughs> out there. There's about five or six that I would go to, um, but is the version Bible app, the Y-O-U, version Bible app. You can go to any verse, any passage, click compare, and it'll sh pop up all, all of them. Them. And I just find the CSB is the one that I like the most. How about you? I, I like that. I mean, I, I get it. I actually do go to the CSB quite often, but because I did grow up with a new international version, an NIV, um, it's the go-to Bible I start with because it's the thing I'm the most familiar with. And we're right. going to learn as we study research that it's kind of nice to start with what you may know and then branch out from there because it helps you yeah. be able to kind of come from a different perspective then as you're, you're reading the passage in different translations. Okay, so let's dive in because I just threw a bunch of translation stuff at you and I want to teach you about how to research. Um, probably my most favorite question to ask when doing Bible study, I say favorite a lot, um, is to read and reflect and actually ask what observations and questions do you have when you're reading this passage? You may want to reread it over and over and over. This is why sometimes I'll start in my New International Version because I want to to start with a familiar passage, reread it, and to say, what are my questions? So like, let's use Hebrews 11.1 1 as an example. It says, faith is the reality of what is hoped for and evidence of things not seen. Um, it, you know, I'm trying to think, Sarah, what kind of questions would come to mind if you heard the verse about faith is the reality of what is hoped for? Yeah. If I focus on that part, I, quite frankly, I don't know what that even means. Mm -hmm. The reality of what is hoped for. Yeah. So, like, so there's something more mean? than it's beyond just hoping for something to be true. There's a reality to it, but yeah, that's what's, what's reality. What is right? that? Yeah. What does it look like? Oh, and what is faith? Like, what do they mean by faith? What does mm -hmm. this really look like? Right. So mm -hmm. you, you start writing down questions. I usually keep a journal alongside of me while I'm doing Bible study and I'll just write those questions down. I'm not going to get to them all in one day. I don't have all the time in the world. I'd love to have all the time in the world, but I don't. <laughs> and so the idea, Idea that we can just take these questions down and then come and revisit them. Sure. Sometimes research will help us. Sometimes author or history is another way that we will observe, get some of our observations answered. But our second thing that we do in research and the thing we've already talked about is looking at different Bible translations. Can we renew our mind by looking and getting a different perspective? Because again, we're trying to triangulate around a word. So when we read Hebrews 11.1 1, and we hear that it's faith is reality of what is hoped for, that's the Christian standard Bible. The KJV it says, now faith is substance of things hoped for. The NIV says faith is confidence of what is hoped for. 
and faith is assurance of things as hoped for as ESV. So we've got reality as substance, confidence, assurance. Well, now that we've read all these different translations, Sarah, what do you think, did, does that give you any clarity on your reality question? Yeah, it sure does. It, faith is based on substance. Mm. We can have confidence in our faith because it's based on something. So that, that really does help. Right. I love that. Mm. I love that. And so we could stop at Bible translations. And for a beginner, I would actually probably say that these two top things are the things that I would hunker in on and say, ask your questions and, and do your um, Bible translations and mm. be done. But if you want to go a next step further, you're like, I still don't get it. <laughs> and by the way, I've been there. Um, we would go to the next, which is to research the actual word meaning in the original language. This is that BibleHub.com, blue letter Bible logo software stuff we, we get into. I looked up reality, um, the word in Greek. It's hypostasis, which is, uh, it means to support, have assurance, have confidence, giving substance to, which I loved that, mm -hmm. or a guaranteeing of. Um, so based on that description, now faith is becoming, is giving substance or guaranteeing hope. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that. Now our Bible translations gave us that inter interpretation. Us saying it and seeing it in the original Greek gives us another layer of that if we didn't feel like we got it. And here, full disclosure, some Bible translations have the exact same word that they use. Like I was looking up jealous the other day and jealous is the same in every single Bible translation. And I was like, oh, I kind of went in this, in one, this one verse I'm studying, I kind of wanted to see a different Bible translation use a different word. And it was all jealous. That's a really good point. Right. So mm -hmm. this is where word study comes in handy because then I'm like, I need to understand what do they mean by jealous? Right. Because obviously every translation is saying it's this word. What is it? What is the Greek meaning my how does that come to life for me so well, especially in a passage where it says the the lord is a jealous god right kind of like fear the lord like well, what you, that doesn't sound great no and all these different <laughs> bible translations are all using the word jealous okay so where do i go with that you, that was the exact first sarah nice work um so so if if i feel like i got stuck what if it you know if we're doing that word study on jealous or you know for this one we're doing it on reality and things that are hoped for, we might pull out a commentary or a study Bible note to be able to see um, what resources we can use that will give us biblical scholar insights. That's our fifth thing um, we, will, we would do in research. And so for me, I ended up opening up my IVP Bible background commentary. And I loved this because it gave me a historical viewpoint, shout out to history, that the Jewish people defined the ultimate hope as in, in terms of the future day of the Lord. Let me repeat that. The Jewish people defined the ultimate hope in terms of the future day of the Lord. So when we're reading this verse, this faith thing that we're hoping for is not just like, I hope for a car and I hope for a million dollars and I'm going to have faith that I can get anything I want. This is hoping that, that the Lord is coming, that, that, that there's, it's, I'm, it's hope in God hmm. and our relationship and being in, in, in union with him. How cool is that? Like that is, that makes this verse way cool. I mean, it was already cool, but way cooler. Um, so the last thing I love to do, and I kind of already started doing it was paraphrasing. I want to rewrite this. If I now understand the word, I've triangulated my way around different Bible translations. Well, how would I rewrite Hebrews 11 one? What would be that verse? And um, I don't know if you have any idea. My, my, my take, Sarah, was like, faith isn't blind faith. It's having confidence and proof, proof in what I believe and, um, and having hope in the future day of the Lord. I loved that, that line. Um, did you, I mean, I don't know if you had no, any. No, I like, like that. that. You I nailed it. it. Like nailed it. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes if I get crazy and I'm like, I don't feel like I got it, I'll go to like a message or a, or a new right. living translation and say, how did that thought for thought paraphrase version, how did they do it to see if I can get any ideas? But man, paraphrasing, it helps us say, D can I plant this in my heart a little bit deeper? Do I really understand what this concept is having? And what's great about Hebrews 11 is right after our verse, it actually gives us examples of Old Testament heroes of faith and how they were faithful. So if we didn't quite get it in verse one, we can now see Abraham and Sarah and all these cool people that are mentioned and why they were faithful and so uh, and showed faith. And I love that, that we got like an extra bonus material when studying a passage like this. Um, yeah, paraphrasing is hard. I, I remember doing a Bible study where we were supposed to paraphrase the passage every single day. It was hard. It took practice, but it really does help 
try to wrap your head around what is being said. Right. And in my own words, like I'm going to say it differently. And so it's okay. Um, My only, this key principle that we have around this one, and the one thing I would just call out is vet your resources carefully. In this research category, you are spending time in other places and it's not just in the text of the Bible. Um, And so vet your resources carefully. If you find that what you're reading in a commentary is not repeated in a lot of other commentaries or study Bibles, there's a caution there. More often than not, you need to be able to see it in more than one place in order for you to say that it's vetted. We have a lot of recommended resources that we have vetted on our website that we recommend in our favorite section. So just make mm-hmm. sure that you're taking a look at that because it's important to make sure that you're not just picking up, you know, Bob's, you know, Bob's commentary on, you know, some website that is a random URL. I mean, we got to be a little bit careful and, and just uh, thoughtful about that part of it. Just watch out for Bob's website. Bob's website. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Just Sorry. kidding, Bob. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. We're, 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 we're in the tail end. We are yes. at the last A of Cara. Yes. <laughs> we are at apply, which is really what we often are going to the Bible for. Mm-hmm. Like it is not just to become smarter. Right. I mean, we love to study the Bible, but the purpose of it is is really for our lives to be transformed by this God that we're learning about. Right. So um, we do tend to save apply for last. Um, and, and that's because we really want to encourage you to, to do some of these other steps. Mm-hmm. Look at the context. Ask how the original hearers would have heard it in history. You know, look at the author's purpose. Maybe look at a couple different translations so that we know that original meaning. We want to take, the goal is to take the original meaning that we're finding in the text and apply it to our lives mm-hmm. um, in, in a variety of ways today. But the meaning remains the same. Um, so from cover to cover, the, the Bible is a book about God. I think sometimes we approach it thinking the Bible is, is, is about all us. about me. <laughs> and we can learn about ourselves certainly through the lens of what we learn about God first. Um, so why do we save apply for last? Uh, one of the things we would like for you to walk away with is the understanding, the, really the awareness that we all approach Scripture um, with certain assumptions and biases, whether it's something that we've been taught growing up, whether it's um, just simply the lens, the cultural lens through which we read the Bible, we bring assumptions to the biblical text all the time, and we don't even realize we're doing it. So um, I want to start, I mean, again, I'm going to go out of order on this one. Just You're to, such a rebel, by the way. Right? I went in, well, actually, I don't know if Did I went in order, but I wanted to go in order. <laughs> but that is something we want to, again, we mentioned this at the beginning, we're going to mention it again right now. This is not a checklist. You don't have to go in order. Um, in fact, if you notice, uh, prayer actually, not, not prayer, um, apply. apply, it spells prayer. The the, uh, the the steps are to pray, respond, ask, yield, express, and remember. We try very hard sometimes <laughs> to make this memorable, mostly for ourselves, but also for you. So, um, but yeah, so there the, we do bring assumptions to the text. So mm-hmm. I want to start with yield. And the question for yield is what personal, cultural, or religious bias and assumptions do you bring to the text? And once you recognize those, what do you need to surrender, if anything, mm-hmm. to be in harmony with the Bible? And um, cultural, these cultural influences, um, can, they can cause us to misread the Bible mm-hmm. in, in several ways. And we're going to look at probably three values here that most Westerners have that may be different in the biblical day, okay? And there's, there's many of them, but we're just going to look at a couple of them here. Um, let's talk about privacy, what do you think, Heather? I mean, privacy, is that, is that important to us today? Um, in uh, America, yes. <laughs> Very much so, isn't it? So when we read a passage like Psalms 4610, be still and know that I am God, I think a lot of us read that through that lens of be alone. I have and, to be alone to do and that. I, for I am God. <laughs> right? Right? And as Heather just talked about different translations, the CSB translation actually says stop fighting and know that I am God. That's good. Now that's different. Mm-hmm. Then, then I just want to go find a quiet spot. I mean, I want to find a quiet spot, but that's I not the too. purpose of this verse. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so the, the point I want to make here is, is that that cultural value of privacy for us, mm-hmm. it can cause us to, um, to project our own values into the text. Our, our view on money, our view on hospitality, our view on honor, shame, whatever we can, we can kind of read those into the text without even realizing it really. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's take another one, Heather. Leadership. How important is leadership in our culture today? And do you think it was 
you know, important back then. Oh, leadership was is huge today. Sure is, right? Yeah. Like independence, entrepreneurship, leadership, like being first, being first. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and so we might tend to emphasize passages that talk about uh, perhaps the leadership in the Bible, but there's actually a lot of passages that men talk about the opposite, mm-hmm. and we might kind of tend to ignore those. Um, Jesus' first and last encounter with Peter, what does he say? Follow me, right? Um, the, and then Jesus says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That is a chiasm, by the way, under author, when we talked about different speech uh, or different patterns, sorry. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Um, Jesus also washes the his disciples' feet, and he tells them to go and do the same. So Jesus is emphasizing something different, I think, than, than leadership, a dependence on, on God, a dependence on him and to serve, right, to serve others. So again, let's not ignore some of those passages um, that maybe... Uh, aren't important to us. No, I was just having this conversation with my kids the other day because I want to teach them independence because that's our culture. And yet that is so anti, like total opposite of the Bible where we're supposed to be dependent on him and dependent on God. Um, So I could see where these type of biases are going to be natural as we go to read. Right. Um, One, let's look at one more uh, value here in saving money. And and that is, that's kind of important to us, right? Mm -hmm. And um, because that's important to us. We can sometimes be blind to the true message of a passage. So let's look at a real quick parable here. It's the parable of the rich fool found in Luke 12, 16 through 21. And it says, a rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and store all my grain and all my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. I mean, that's kind of the American dream right there. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Right? Uh, But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, this passage can kind of make us a little bit uncomfortable because it comes really close to this this virtue that we have of saving money. Mm-hmm. I mean, we even have these idioms, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. Um, this, th- And we assume that this parable is about saving money um, and that God called him a fool. So, quote, it's difficult. What do we do with it? Now, to, to understand really this, we're just going to look at history and context super fast. Hin- history In history, at that time, money was actually viewed as a limited resource. Um, There's only so much to go around. So if one person, this landowner, if he, if he had all the money, that meant that other people didn't have money. So that tells us that this passage is perhaps more about sharing. Like when we look at how the original audience would have heard this, they'd have been like, you should be sharing your wealth, not hoarding it in mm. barns. Um, again, because money was looked at differently. And um, so let's see. Um, okay, so when we look at that, that's that's obviously that that is different. Um, we're kind of looking into the text and we're saying we think this is about this, but what about context? What does context show us? If we read the passages right before this, leading up to this, it's talking about greed and it's talking about being on guard against all greed. And if we go after and we read the text afterwards, it's talking about treasuring the God, things of God and his kingdom and, and not putting, you know, our own priorities uh, ahead of God's kingdom. And so when we, when we look at those, and again, um, the, these assumptions, I'm just going to say that they can be hard to recognize, mm-hmm. like on, on our own. We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> you know, we don't we're often know the lens through which we're, we're, we're seeing and reading scripture. Or the lens that they were seeing and reading scripture. That's absolutely right. Um, so a couple of tools here. You know, again, we're going to say it again, a study Bible. Mm-hmm. They, they can help you. The study notes that are in, in those um, different study Bibles will have different study notes. So that's also maybe a reason to have more than one someday. Um, but they can help us a ton. Doing Bible study with a diverse group of people mm-hmm. and, and hearing it the way somebody else from maybe a different age, um, demographic, ethnic background, or faith background can can really kind of um, challenge the way we're seeing it. Mm-hmm. And and just to help us be aware that, gosh, maybe I'm reading this through a filter uh, with these cultural uh, biases and assumptions. Okay, 
So let's move on then to the next one. So we're going to talk about prayer. And this is truly... <laughs> as, as you go to apply, you're saying we should pray? We should pray. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like, don't forget this one. This is probably the most important one. Every time you open your Bible and you want to apply it to your life, I mean, just pray. God, what do you want me to know? And how should I apply this to my life? Mm-hmm. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, and in fact, that would be a, a good prayer with the, with the pair we just talked about, mm-hmm. what do you want me to know and how am I supposed to apply this to my life? Um, we can talk about, uh, the next thing we can talk about is asking, uh, ask, what do you learn about God? Love this question. We, this is one of our favorite questions. Again, a favorite. <laughs> Every time we, we do a Bible study, we like to end the Bible study with, what do I learn about God? I also ask this with my kids as we're reading the Bible together. If they're going to answer one question, what did you learn about God as you were reading it? Right. So good. And in, in case, in this case, it's, you know, I think God cares about what we treasure. Mm-hmm. He cares about where, our, where we invest our time and our money and our thoughts. And he cares that we be generous mm-hmm. with others. Um, and then let's see, let's move on to a lot of these in apply are kind of, um, they kind of make sense. Yeah. It, you know, They're intuitively. Intuitive. Yeah. yeah. They, they kind of make sense. Um, so let's talk about respond. This is, um, the, the fourth item and let's see, we have six, I think, um, on this list here. So when we respond, what was expected, the question is what was expected of the original audience and and what principle makes sense for us today? Was this a cultural truth or a timeless truth? And in this case, I think it's pretty obvious that this is, gosh, there is a timeless truth here. I mean, now we're not necessarily building barns to store our money in, but the timeless truth, you know, watch out for greed and be generous. Mm -hmm. So that, that's timeless. That, that applies to that. The same for us today as it did back then. Um, now a cultural truth, Heather, you actually mentioned one earlier. Oh, my jewelry one? Yes. Uh, in, in first Timothy two, the idea that we're supposed to get rid of jewelry is definitely cultural, mm-hmm. right? The cultural truth is that that was something for them at that time in that period where they needed to not look like pagans, but there is a timeless truth in there of that. We probably need to be thinking about how do we set ourselves apart to be, be different than those around us. Like that, that piece I could say is yes, the timeless truth we can pull out of it, but there is a hundred percent a cultural truth that I am so glad I get to wear my earrings today. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I forgot mine. So I'm wearing yours. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Then another step here is to express. And, and I love this one because it's really what fears or concerns do you have about applying this to your life? That's just an honest question. Um, it really takes apply and makes it personal and relational with God. Mm. What fears do I have about this passage? Um, I mean, personally, my, my husband and I, we have, uh, our income is commission-based, and it can really be feast or famine. And so because of that, we do, in, in seasons where there's plenty, we do save up, not necessarily in barns, but I, I kind of like that idea. Right. Uh, we, we do save up for, for seasons when there's very little. And so I think a fear for, for me might be, what if... What if I give away today, Lord, what we might need tomorrow? Mm. And um, that's just being an, you know, an honest fear. And uh, then I can <laughs> work on trusting God, yeah. right? <laughs> um, the final step here is to, is to remember. To remember uh, the, a passage that stands out to you so that you can recall God's word anytime, anywhere, Mm-hmm. and especially share it with your children when they need to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Happens every day. Thy, God's word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee in Psalms as, uh, is one that I planted in my heart so at such an early age to remind me to continually memorize verses because it's so needed, especially yes. in dark and, and times. But, for, you know, even for this verse, like this passage, there's a lot we could learn that we should be putting to, to memory. Yeah. Uh, if you were to read just after this little uh, parable in, in Luke 12, 34, there's a common verse you probably are familiar with, for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Mm. That might be a verse that I would choose to remember here. The key principle with apply is the Bible cannot mean now what it didn't mean back then. And we kind of already talked about this. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to look for the original meaning. You're going to have to probably do some of these steps in this car guide first to to get there. They'll help you. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but some of them. And, um, And then try to apply the original meaning to your life today. Yeah. So if you were a beginner on apply mm. and you only had a few a few moments, where would you spend your time? Great question. Prayer. Prayer. We're, we're all the time. Start there. I the Holy Spirit is the best way to reveal God's word to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think prayer. I I, we, I like we said. I love asking the question. What do you learn about God? Mm-hmm. As often as we can. And I, and then just to just an awareness that we often bring assumptions to the text. So trying to read the Bible with an open mind. 
It goes to that eisegesis that I mentioned, that really nerdy mm-hmm. word I mentioned earlier, is this idea that we're bring, we bring in mm-hmm. an idea of what we think the text should mean. And it comes from our culture, our backgrounds, all these different pieces. And so just being in tune to it is, is huge. You know, this, yeah. so we've, we've done C-H-A-R-A. There's been a lot of questions. So five questions. There's a lot of sub-questions underneath mm-hmm. every single one of these. It might feel overwhelming. Sarah, if you were to say, man, you only have a short bit of time to do Bible study. You're not going to be able to spend the entire time on this CARA booklet guide. I just need a couple of questions that were going to help me guide. What are your, out of the full booklet, what are your go-to questions that are like, are the, the go-to places where you're like, yes, I need to do that? Context. Context, context. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that would truly reading the surrounding text around a passage to understand what it means would be my number one mm-hmm. question. Um, I, I love under history the idea of trying to, to hear it the way the original audience would have heard it. How, how did they they hear this? And um, if I do get a third one, <laughs> probably trying to understand the author's purpose. Yeah. And and then how is what I'm reading, how does it fit within that purpose? Yeah. How okay. about you, Heather? First, first of all, we did not plan this, y'all. Um, so we have a bookmark that we have that you can download off of our website that has five questions you can ask, one under each of the letters. You just actually said three of them, Sarah. All right. That cracks me up because I the fourth one I was going to say was reading different Bible translations, and that is the fourth one on yeah. our bookmark. Um, and it's, it's more about, you know, what questions do you have and how do you further research them? But Bible translations, I feel like if you ever get stuck, that seems to be yeah. a way to be able to to kind of get out of it once you've read the context and you might be stuck on something that helps you get a better perspective um and so if you are yeah. quick on time or short on time and need um you know you, the car booklet may feel like i'm not you know that's that's too much for this moment i'm going to use it when i do deeper bible study or maybe i have a little bit more time pick up our booklet because that's actually our bookmark. Our, our bookmark it's a great way to be able to have just the five questions again very easy to tuck into your bible also really great for group bible study to be able to ask around a question because these are just five simple questions you can ask that can get to the heart of the passage. And by the way, these are not five brand new questions. These They're five... all from the booklet. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. And so we we unwrapped um, the CARA Bible Study Guide today. You know, if you have not downloaded your own, we recommend that you go and do it. It's got a great resource for you to be able to understand and discover the Bible on its own terms. And we're just so thankful that you stuck in and uh, to to walk through with this because this is going to transform the way you do Bible study. We'll be praying for you that it will, and we look forward to talking to you next time.